Hi everyone, welcome to our um, series of case studies with producers across the northwest New South Wales. Um, my name's Kate McCarthy and I'm a livestock officer and today I'm here with Matt Avendano and we're talking about some of the strategies that they used um, with their beef cattle enterprise during the drought, um, how it all came about, wh why they implemented those strategies, in particular confinement feeding and early weaning. Um, so thanks for talking to us, Matt. And um, yeah, if you could just run through, I guess, how it all came about and, and what you implemented. Yep. Um, well, we obviously uh, early weaned our calves. Um, we went pretty early down to 100 kilos and they came off mum but it kind of started was um start of 2018 things had been pretty dry the year before or the, for a number of years before that even with 2016 we had a wet winter but aside from that it was a uh, another below average year yeah and um we didn't have our large pasture reserve which we usually operate on and um looking forward we realized you know we're coming out of the warmer months which is our typical growing season for our subtropicals where we grow our feed and um yeah, so we thought that we had to do something. So, you know, the feed was short and we had little calves at foot. So um, we actually went to a LLS um, day in Narrabri that Sally Balmain and Naomi Hobson ran about early weaning. And we had already started thinking about that before. And that kind of was a really good starting point. Um, to, you know, give me, it gave me a good basis yeah. to know where to start to look into things from there. Yeah. And um, yeah, so after that day, I um, realised how much I didn't know. Yeah. And so I started to, you know, look in step by step first. Um, so I started off with the wean, obviously, what had to be done there. And, you know, that's a pretty common thing, obviously, weaning, but yep. weaning down to this size. So I spoke to a few people. Um, what, what, like, what did you wean them down to? So it was 100 kilos. So anything above 100 kilos got weaned. Um, which is, you know, a pretty small calf, really. Yeah. Can normally, we, you know, we, we might weigh it 250 to 300 kilos. Yeah. So, yeah, so I started off um, with calves that small. I thought, you know, I needed to find out who I could talk to about that. And I, um, so I spoke to a few people that I know that um, raise dairy potties, obviously, from very yeah. small calves and how they go about things, as well as the um, livestock officers and also a few nutritionists about yep. the different requirements. And I started from there. Um, and some spoke to the you know, the district vets and things like that about a bit of a, a health program for them. Yeah. And so obviously, being such little calves, they're going to be pretty stressful time when they came off mum. So the plan was that um, you know a pretty extensive vaccination program. Yeah. Because how many like in your early weaning and your confinement feeding setup, how how big like how many um, weaners were you putting in each sort of confinement pen? Well. Uh, in total, we had about 850 the first year, um, so they were split three ways, but on um, more or less bodies, you know, on their weight, so their size of their animal. Yeah. Um, ideally, we might have done it body size as well as gender, but we didn't have that capability, and it I really couldn't, didn't see a, a downside um, to it once we started doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, so we kind of, uh, we split them to start with how how far along we thought their rumen development would be so what kind of diet they needed so we went um from 100 kilos up to 150 or 175 around there and they yep. got a you know a much higher protein diet and we yep. were much more careful with those guys yeah and then uh we went from kind of from that 175 kilos to around 300 and then they got us uh, you know a particular ration for them yeah and the big guys, you know, went on to what was more or less just a basic feedlot feed ration. Feedlot ration. Yep. Um, we are just looking before, looking at some of the bunker f feeding setups that you have. Run us through how you, like, what was, you know, you said you sort of thought now you looked at space and you thought, oh, I don't know if that's quite suitable, but you really didn't think it was impractical. Yeah, well, I just looked at the um, recommendations for feed bunk area per animal and, like, water trough space per animal, and we... Well, I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't get anywhere close to those recommendations, and at the time, I just had to make do with what we could. Yep. Um, so we just made some very rough homemade feeders um, to start with. Well, well, actually, before that, we brought some waste not feeders because initially we weren't mixing a ration, and um, we didn't have a feed mixer. So uh, they got their hay in a waste not feeder and their grain separately in a uh, advantage feeder, and yep. they're both. Um, you know, they're probably more expensive feeders um, in that kind of, but they were most definitely worth it with yep. the price of the 
at the of the feed at the time. Had you like had you before this had you supplementary fed at such an intense level before? Uh, no, nothing, nothing like it really. Like we're a pretty big pasture operation. They do in you know tough winter cows will get some cotton seed or something like that. Yeah. But no, we don't. We, we'd never done anything like this. Um, we'd only just started to really grain feed anything in the couple of uh, with weaners in the prior few years. So it was a um, pretty big step out yeah. of kind of what we normally do. And I think like one of the things you said before was like because this was a strategy you used in the drought, you wanted to make it practical and user friendly, yeah. really for your enterprise. Like, so what were some of the things you thought around? Like you said about the feed like you didn't have the right feed out set system what like what did you start to change as things went on well it was the first step really was um to get a mixer and we were pretty lucky that we could could do that um but that's something you know we were, we were having good success prior to that and um, we just you know feed uh straw uh, hay separately yeah. to grain and they also got a dry lick which was really important for little calves that were being you know intensely fed like this to make sure they got all their macro and micronutrients I suppose yeah but um yeah so we had that and then but afterwards yeah the bit that was going all right but it could have been more cost effective with a with a feed mixer so that's what we did yep. um we got one we started to mix a proper ration and then we had to you know we converted the waste not feeders um into just into one big long feeder and made some homemade trough uh feed bunks as well yeah just you know out of things like we had some uh big uh, 4,000 litre water tanks, yeah. some old ones that yeah. were half rusted out, so we cut them in half and turn them upside down and use them as a feeder, things like that. Yep. And um, just, you know, it had to be very cost effective things that yep. we had. I couldn't afford to buy proper um, feed bunks and proper water troughs. You either, just made so. do with what you... Yep. And when we were talking before, like when we were talking about some of the things doing the case study, like you really broke down all of your costs and, and made sure that you were doing it, but you were doing it with an element of precision. So what was some of the things that you really honed in on, especially like even if it's to do with you were really specific with their ration, how much they were getting, how much it was increasing, all that sort of stuff? Yep. Well, I'd say the first thing there is you've got to talk to people that know what they're doing. Um, you know, it's probably, you know, it's no good really asking your mates or something like that if they don't know what they're talking about. So I, you know, actively... That was probably the most valuable thing I'd done was to, you know, speak... To, it was easily the most valuable thing I'd done was to speak to the people that knew. But yep. so with the, you know, nutritionists, there's plenty of really good nu animal nutritionists about. And, you know, they, yep. a lot of them have feedlot experience. Yep. So, and, you know, with the, their encouragement, uh, the, the, probably the second most valuable thing was I really rung around and, you know, spoke to a lot of different people about different feed options and where yep. I could get it from and source it from and all yep. of the things like that. And then, obviously, just... Um, after that, you know, on the, you know, fairly easily, um, you know, you've got to measure what you put into them every yeah. day, and so I fairly regularly, at least once a month, was weighing um, the animals, so I knew what they were averaging, so I knew kind of what they needed to be fed a day, like in terms of quantity, yep. and then, yeah. Because one of the other things you said to me, like you weren't doing it for maintenance, like yeah. you, you were doing it because you wanted productivity, yep. so... Like, yes, we all, like, obviously it's a strategy to confinement feed, and I, I guess it's, it depends on what your focus is. But if it's going to be something that's going to be requiring, you know, a financial component, then it's important to look at that cost effectiveness of it. And then that, you know, that goes as far as what's, you know, what they're consuming and how much that's going to be, um, I guess, improving productivity in this circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. I am. Um, at worst, I... You know, I could do no worse than break even, you know, than things were. And the only way I could break even was if I was hoping it would rain and they could go, then go out into the paddock yep. um, and then hopefully make something there. But that didn't eventuate the first year, so they had to be fed for production the whole way through. And they all went, um, you know, they went to, you know, things like Woolies and Coles and those yep. kind of markets. So yep. What you know. about, like, talking about the ration side of things, like we, it was a challenge to source roughage and sometimes grain and certain components um, during the drought, how did you guys, find, like did you have stuff on farm or? So we had very little on farm, um, we just in the past that hasn't really been, we've made a little bit of hay and things like that and we had planned to make some but after a number of really hard years in a row we um, didn't really have anything on farm, we didn't have any grain, well, we had a tiny bit of grain but nothing compared to what we needed. So I was just, I didn't have any experience really buying any kind of fodder or anything like that. So that was, you know, that was where it really paid to ring around and talk to people about different options and things like that. And 
whether it was a nutritionist or a grain broker or something like that. And yeah, yeah, and just you know, I spoke to these guys, and if they couldn't help me, then they'd point me on to someone, someone who who could. Who could. Yeah, so, and it was really good that you know, just about everyone I spoke to was really happy to go out of their way to help. Yeah. And that was, you know, without that I would have been, you know, lost. So, yeah. What yeah. do you think, like, especially on the early weaning side of things? Well, the, the cost of the um, size of the little ones, 100 kilos, and, you know, a lot of them were below. Well, a lot of them were young enough that their rim wasn't developed. So that was kind of um, the number one thing that I identified that was the number one um, importance that we had to do with them is get their rim to develop. And after that, things would get a lot easier. Yeah. But also we had a, um, you know, the, with the stress of everything, uh, you know, talking to vets and people that know that, you know, that's when animals get sick, when they're stressed. So before they were weaned, um, we tried to have them, you know, with the vaccinations we use, we tried to have them at fully protected when at the point of weaning to yeah. try and give them that protection as the stress stressful point started. So. so I suppose, like, if you were, for people listening in and if we are to encounter this, hopefully in the not-so-near future, what do you think you would put as a bit of a advice from your experience well um the big the big one is talk to people that know what they're talking about um you know the every you know that's the most important thing you can do that's the most that's the best use of time thanks for talking to us matt and and hopefully yeah you've pulled some key key messages out of you know seeing how the avandanos did things and um you know why what drove them to make that decision and what they learnt from it so thanks for that matt no worries